My name is Andrew White. I direct the Center for New York City Affairs here at the New School, at the Milano School. Um, when we had originally set this up, we had this vision that it would already have been through the council or wouldn't get there until next week, but I guess we, we uh, hit it right in the spot where um, they are deliberating whether or not to pass the bill, which is at the center of this discussion. Um, before I get to talking about the topic of paid leave, I want to thank the funders of this program, the Milano Foundation and the Cyrus Fund, which support most of our public programming at the center. Um, in addition to teaching politics and urban policy at the New School, I direct the Center for New York City Affairs, and you hopefully know about our work on public schools and child welfare and community development and other issues. We, we, in our work, we combine investigative reporting and explanatory journalism with policy analysis and, and um, work on data and collaboration with other organizations in order to advance innovation in policy and programs. And our target is um, supporting families, strengthening neighborhoods, and reducing urban poverty. <laughs> And the strategy we use in general is to try and learn on the ground what works and what makes a difference for families and neighborhoods. Um, and then try and take those ideas and lift them up into public view and into government and into policy. And you can read a great deal about, more about our work on our website at centernyc.org. We have a related program on the evening of May 27th. And that's the Bill Green Forum. It's um, in honor of the late Bill Green, who was congressman from the Upper East Side, um, a progressive, relatively progressive Republican who was also chair of the Milano Board of Governors for many years. Um, that event is called Marching in Place, the Great Recession, Low-Income Working Women and Economic Inequality. And we are lucky to have a number of people coming up from Washington to be on the panel, uh, including um, Mark Greenberg, who was at Georgetown Law School for many years and is now in the Obama administration, um, and Paige Gardner, who's founder of Women's Voices, Women's Vote. So I hope you can make it to that event. This card is out on the table out there. <clears throat> the center's approach to social justice reflects the Milano School itself and its students, many of whom are here and helped set up this program. We teach the tools of urban policy and the skills of management, but we don't teach it only in the classroom. We use New York and other cities as laboratories and we teach true difficult, re the true difficult reality of policy implementation in a political environment. This program is dealing with one of those issues I'm hoping today we're gonna hear how difficult it really is to implement something that seems so basic to so many of us who are privileged enough to have sick leave and family leave. Milano students include current and future policymakers, nonprofit leaders, labor and community activists, legislative staff, staffers, and private sector executives. Many of them already work in government or are headed towards work in government or in the nonprofit sector. I'm not going to say a whole lot about the topic at hand today because we have much more clued in experts than I. Um, but I do want to say that. <clears throat> You know, we now know that the New York workforce includes well over a million people who have no paid sick leave. And the city council met yesterday to debate and hear testimony on whether or not the city should require private business to provide it. At the center, we have a particular angle on this because we've done a great deal of research on child and family poverty. About one third of the city's children live in poverty and about 54% of children living in single mother families in New York City are in poverty. That's more than half of all children with a single mom. So why is that relevant? Because as you'll hear, those workers without sick leave are most likely to be at the lower levels of the economic le uh, ladder. And that's where single moms can be found in great numbers and where African American and Hispanic men and women are found in greater numbers than whites. In fact, single moms are more likely to be in the workforce today than they were 10 or 15 years ago. And that's mostly a good thing, I, I believe, simply because the opportunities for wages, I mean, for making a decent living are better if you're in the workforce. But how does that play out when you don't have benefits? That's what we're going to explore today. 
We'll also explore the economics of imposing leave requirements on small business. If it were, were required, would it mean fewer jobs for the working poor? Um, before we get to the program, a couple of logistical points. First, of course, turn off your cell phones. Um, at some point during the panel discussion, we'll try and we'll be including the audience. So the way that works is we have uh, staff who are going to carry mics around. You'll just put up your hands. Sharon, the moderator, will let you know um, when she's ready to bring you all into the discussion and um, put up your hands. The microphone will come around. Um, I'm very pleased that we have Sharon Lerner here to lead the conversation. After many years covering health care at the Village Voice, she came to work at the center uh, back around, uh, around 2004. And she worked with me for a few years on projects regarding child care and families in crisis. She left a couple of years ago to work on this book, which is over on the table there. And it's thrilling to see it finally in hard copy. Um, at the end of this morning's session, feel free to go over and buy a copy. Or even while we're talking, you can probably go over and buy a copy. Um, you can tell from the title that Sharon takes a position, and she backs it up with a lot of material. So she'll spend some time discussing what she learned in her reporting, and she'll put the paid leave discussion in a national context. This is a, much more than a discussion about one bill before the city council. At the same time, Sharon's a skilled journalist committed to delving into the issues and learning from real people. And I say that because by agreeing to be the moderator here, she has agreed to, she's committed herself to, to, uh, to bringing a, forth a constructive dialogue on the issues and encouraging all sides to be heard and understood. So while the city council appears to be moving towards legislation, it's not a simple topic. It's worth finding out as much as we can. Um, and I hope you all get the chance to engage with opposing arguments. Sharon. Hi, thanks. Uh, thank you, Andrew. It is really a thrill to be here. Um, as he said, I left, I left because I, was, I had the combination of a newborn and a, and a book contract. And, and I wanted to, to stay, but it was not possible. So there, anyway, but it's a thrill to be back here and to be part um, for a moment of what the center does. So uh, good morning and welcome. And as Andrew said, we're here to talk about paid sick leave. And it's very exciting that there's so much movement um, in this city and, and, and so much activity. And we're going to hear a whole lot about that. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of that, I want to talk a little bit about where this fits in. Um, it is, as Andrew said, part of something bigger, which is exciting. Um, that there's there's movement uh, around the country on on a, a number of different related issues, but the the other side of that, it is a part of something bigger, and that it's part of a bigger problem um, nationally. And to give some context for that, I thought I'd start internationally, um, which is how I kind of came to the subject of my book. Um, I I was approached about um, writing a book on the subject of women's progress in motherhood, which is, of course, enormous. Um, and, but when I started thinking and reading uh, in depth, what really struck me was how our country, when you look internationally in terms of women's progress, is an outlier in, the, in a number of ways. And it, it just was really perplexing. And I'll tell you, there are three things that struck me. One is that we have really high rates of full-time employment among women, almost the highest in the world. I, it was, I thought it was the highest. I think Sweden might be a tiny bit higher, but it, we're up there, you know, really high up. The other thing is that we, as a country, have a lot of children. Um, and I say that meaning compared to other rich countries. Um, right now, we're at replacement rep level, which is about 2.1. Not so high, really. But when you look around the world at other rich countries that are, you know, somewhat comparable to us, more than 90 developed countries have had their fertility rates go beneath 2.1 uh, recently, and that's and uh, over the past few decades, and that's what's happened as women entered the workforce in great numbers. It appears that the two things were in, in some ways incompatible. Um, 
working and having lots of kids. So here we are, we have women working a lot and working a lot of hours and compared to other countries, having a lot of children. But then the third thing that makes it really puzzling, the other way that we're an outlier, is that we, when you look at other rich countries, have far less supports. In uh, what I end up focusing on in my book um, are the availability of childcare, uh, flexible work options, and paid family leave. Um, and you know, in all of those areas, we're outliers in really extreme ways. In some cases, like with paid leave, you know, we're one of a tiny handful of countries in the world that don't have it. So you have, you know, the tiny drought-plagued African nation of Djibouti providing 14 weeks paid, and then we don't have that here. Um, so you look at these three, three things together and you say, wow, how is that possible? And what, and the question I tried to answer is, so what is, what does this mean for um, American women? And in particular, what does this mean for American women on the, the lower end of the economic spectrum? Um, so anyway, that, that's where I'm coming from. But it's so interesting when you look at paid leave, which is really part of a system, again, of family supports, um, to see that we're outliers here too internationally. We're, this, this is something that other countries have managed to do and think of as um, a part, you know, a part of providing a, a decent workplace and, and a, a reasonable way of life. So um, it's so exciting to see this issue heating up here. It's not just heating up here, it's part of something bigger. Um, we have seen activity in uh, New Jersey, Washington DC, San Francisco, other parts of the country, and we're gonna hear more about that. Um, so, so now let's try to think, you know, with that in mind, the bigger, bigger picture, I am going to uh, talk about, we'll talk now, start more by introducing the panelists and talking in greater detail about what exactly is going on here and um, how we're going to address it. So, um, panelists, you, you wanna come on up? Um, does that, is that how we're gonna do it, yeah? And I'll, I'll introduce you guys. Okay, so everybody should have um, in uh, detailed bios of our panelists. So I'm just gonna give you the quick lowdown on each of them before we, we jump into a conversation. Um, to my immediate left, Mary Watson here is Associate Professor of Management and uh, Chair of the Management Programs right here at Milano. And, uh, and Mary has done lots of work in the area, as we'll hear. Um, okay, immediately to her left is Sherry Luand. She is co-founder and executive director of A Better Balance, the Work and Family Legal Center, which is intimately involved in the fight for uh, um, paid sick time. And immediately to her left is Nancy Ploger, who's president of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. And immediately to her left is Shibani Patel, who is a staff attorney and, and organizer at the Restaurant Opportunity Center of New York, uh, which represents nearly 2,500 restaurant workers and their families. So good morning, everyone. Um, to start out, I, I want um, just <coughs> some, uh, probably everybody in this room knows the basics, basics of this issue, but let's take a minute. Um, and maybe Sherry, you can you can just start by giving us some numbers on the estimates of New Yorkers who um, who ha don't have uh, paid uh, paid sick time. Okay. Right, um, Nancy Rankin, who's here um, and from A Better Balance and um, and the Community Service Society. Um, so Better Balance and the Community Service Society did a um, did a, an extensive study, a survey of New Yorkers, the, the CSS does um, the unheard <coughs> third analyzing the lives of uh, the lowest third of, uh, of, of New Yorkers in terms of income. And um, this, is, this, is the, this is their report, <laughs> Sick in the City, which is a great report. And um, what it found in, um, in the research that they did was that there are at least 1.3 million um, 
1.3, between 1.3 and 1.5 million New Yorkers who do not have any paid time off, that's any paid time off, to use when they're sick. Um, uh, significantly more don't have any dedicated sick leave, but that's, that's the number. And that's 48% of the workforce in New York City. So it's a, it's a, for those of us who've worked their lives in white collar jobs, professional jobs, um, the uh, office jobs, I think that I think that's a shocking number. Um, and and in fact, many people don't believe it. And there are some people out there who are trying to do other research to make 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 it um, make other other um, other points. But. Uh, the CSS has been doing this work for a long time, and it's a, it's a very reliable report. So it's an extensive problem in New York. Um, nationwide, uh, there's similar statistics. Um, so, uh, do, we, do we have an, an estimate of the total number nationwide? I think, I think it's, I th think it's 65 million. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, again, around half of the workforce, a little less, unless somebody has private sector report. Right, right, right. So yeah, and I should make that point also. I, I it's mm -hmm. it's private sector employers, employees. Okay. But it is it's a national problem and um, there are different ways it's being addressed on a national level. There are <coughs> movements for paid sick days all around the country um, as, as there is for paid family leave. So Okay, great. Now, um, Shibani, I'm hoping that you can tell us um, <coughs> What it would, what it means to be one of those workers without paid sick time. What happens? Um, what happens when you don't have paid sick time and you get sick? Well, um, first of all, I'm really excited to be here. Um, we work very closely with the new school, so it's it's really exciting to come here and talk to the public about what we do. Uh, regarding how it affects restaurant workers, what's interesting about the restaurant industry is it's kind of a microcosm of uh, kind of all the structural problems that we have as a nation. You have issues of race, you have issues of gender discrimination, you have health and safety issues. So this issue is just so important. Um, this, very similar to the healthcare debate, will make huge impact. Um, I can give maybe examples of what I've heard from workers. I know folks um, who were at the hearing yesterday heard some very stirring testimonies. Um, one of my favorite stories, because it's so egregious, um, she did not testify yesterday. It was a worker who worked at Palm Restaurant. As we know, the Palm is a very world famous, you know, renowned steakhouse. She was um, a stalker in the back of the house, and she was pregnant. And when, even though she was pregnant, and she told her, you know, managers, I'm pregnant, I may not be able to do so much lifting, um, they did not listen to her. They still assigned her the same task. They didn't give her any sort of adjustment to the workload. She was bleeding internally. She nearly miscarried her child. She had to go to the emergency room for emergency treatment. Nothing from the employer. She came back to, to work. And they said, well, you know, we just felt bad for you, so you could still keep your job. She nearly miscarried her child. I will say her and the child are healthy now. But this is an example of why I think paid sick days is important. Something like this could impact someone like her, her life very strongly. She could have taken a paid sick day, gotten care, and had access to that. Um, other issues we hear of, I'll, I could talk about some of the testimonies yesterday. One was a worker who, hers was a more kind of gross story. She, um, everyone in the restaurant industry argues that, hey, people can cover shifts. You know, you always have someone to cover. She worked at a smaller restaurant where it's not as easy. And many of these restaurants are smaller restaurants, especially in New York, size-wise and staff-wise, they're smaller. She spoke to the point that no one could cover her shift. She had food poisoning. She came to work. She was, set, she was a bartender setting up for dinner. She's setting up, she's like, as I was setting up, I was feeling, not feeling so great. Told my manager, I'm not feeling good. Can I go home? Didn't respond. She started bartending and she said, and I'm, this is a kind of a quote, she said, I must tell you that everything that could happen to one in the bathroom was happening to me. I was running between the bar and the bathroom. She's like, as you can imagine, it was, the service was horrible. Customers were not enjoying it. One of her regular customers even looked at her and said, you need to go home. You're not looking too good. And so that's the part where I think it's also bad for business. Well, can I ask um, Absolutely. Sherry and uh, Shibani, so what happens if you don't have paid sick time? Sometimes, you know, you, you can't even make it through a shift. You take the time off. Do people get fired? And does anybody have estimates of how many people get fired in that situation for taking time off that isn't? 
I don't. Th I'm not sure that we we do have those numbers. Um, I will say that in preparing for the hearing yesterday, mm -hmm. um, we had decided that workers' stories were really important to get across because you know, there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, it's it, we have informal policies. Really good employers, you know, won't 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 fire anybody certainly if they're if they're ill. So our the coalition thought, oh well, we'll get people who went to work sick because it'll be so hard to find people who were fired. As it happens, we had so many people, we found so many people who had been fired because um, they were sick. And, and two of the testimonies yesterday, which I found you know, really uh, sh shocking but also moving, um, what one, one young woman who's, um, whose baby uh, was in the ho hospital, she picked her up at daycare after the job, um, and um, she's a two-year-old child. She couldn't breathe. She took her to the emergency room. They admitted her. Her oxygen intake was low, um, and um, it was it was a weekend. Sunday, she was in the hospital. Sunday night, it appeared the baby would still be in the hospital, so she called the bank where she worked um, that night. The service didn't pick up, so she called again 6.30 the next morning and said, I can't come in. My baby's in the hospital. The supervisor said, fine, just bring documentation when you come back to work. Um, the baby was released Tuesday night. Her day off was Wednesday. She went back to work Thursday morning, and she was fired. Mm -hmm. um, and that that happens a lot. There were a lot of workers who we um, who we talked to who didn't want to testify or couldn't testify because they have um, they have things going on with their own employers or um, or new jobs, and they were worried. But um, the there was a legal services attorney who had testified about the. The, the numbers, the huge numbers of clients she sees who are fired because of this. So uh, it does happen, and, and, and you know, we have the testimonies of people who, who it's happened to. Okay. Nancy, um, you represent a huge number of businesses in the city. Um, to what degree do you think this is a problem, the lack of paid sick leave, the uh, sick time that we're hearing about? Well, um, first of all, with all due respect, we do understand that uh, this study was done. Um, we know that there are about 3.5 million workers and employer, employees in the city. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know exactly how many uh, of the employees were interviewed for this particular study. We don't have any indication of the types of industries that were studied. Was it cross-section, whatever. But before I get into that, I think there's one thing that we all need to agree on here. There are good employers and there are bad employers. Is, it, is that something we all can agree on? And there are good employees and there are bad employees. And that, is that also something we can agree on? Are you asking the panelists? I, I'm asking the panelists, everybody in general. I'm just trying to bring the issue up in the room that there are good and bad in, in both sectors so that we start on a general uh, ground of fairness, understanding that there are good employers and there are bad employers and there are good employees and there are bad employees who will take advantage of certain circumstances. And if we can start from that basis, I think it's a more general conversation, recognizing that there are bad employers. And you know what? It gives the good employers a bad name. And we would love to be able to do something to get to those bad employers and help fix this problem. Mm -hmm. But frankly, we do not know the extent of the problem and which industries this problem is specifically um, addressing. So that's why we are undertaking a study over the next several months that both uh, City Speaker uh, Quinn, Council Member Brewer, and uh, other council members who are heads of certain committees are aware that we're undertaking this study to see if we can root out those industries and those bad employers and help to fix the problem. The, the unfortunate part of this is that um, many of uh, us, I will include myself, have to understand that we are not dealing with the big bad Enrons of the world. We're dealing with a lot of small employers. And one of the things that I think people tend to forget, and this was, a, was an issue that I brought up after 9-11, the first thing when you have a disaster is you try to take care of people, save lives, uh, create uh, a roof over people's heads, give them food, give them water, and once that's stabilized, then what needs to happen? You need to redevelop the business community so that those people can get back to work, so that those store owners can open their shops, and so that the workers can go back to work and make a salary. 
and the small businesses are always the unforgotten victims in these types of disasters. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because basically one thing we forget, a small business owner is a person too. They have families, they have kids, they have some of the same issues that the employees do, but it's multiple twice because they're not only worrying about their employees, they're worrying about their families as well. So all the same issues that are, the employees are dealing with are the same that the employers are dealing with from a family perspective. Okay. So I just wanted to bring that up. Um, so the bottom line answer to your question is that um, until we have a real thorough study so we can understand what industries, we understand that the restaurant industry does have bad employers and we'd like to help get that rooted out so that we can correct the situation because it's so you, you see that, it, that there is something that needs correcting for sure right yes right but, yes. but as you noted that this is a national issue mm -hmm. this is we'll not come to that we'll York come to that later i want can to ask I respond you to some of um your yeah, can I, statements can about the restaurant about the industry um cross-sector industry statement that you made uh okay yeah. um so i can speak to the restaurant industry obviously we have a report that we released last September called Burned. It's at the front if you'd like it. And we did a survey about health and safety issues faced by restaurant workers, not just the issue of um, sick leave and sick time, but also hazards at work because of lack of training, lack of access to proper facilities. And from this, we surveyed um, many, many restaurant workers. And from the survey, we found that almost, I believe it's 90% do not have a paid sick, or 90% have come to work sick coughed, sneezed, whatnot, while handling folks' food. And about 80% do not have a paid sick day. So that, that industry has actually been studied. And currently, we have rocks around the country compiling a national study about this. OK, so we, so we have various bits of research, and not bits, not to minimize. We have research in. Nancy, you would like more. I'm curious if, if you think that your research will be completed before a bill is passed in New York City. Yes, we hope so. Uh -huh. Um, okay, well, let's turn our attention then to, I mean, now that we, we all agree that there is an issue that needs to be addressed, now we should talk about the legislation that right now is attempting to address it. That's before the council, okay? Um, Sherry, you were at the hearings yesterday. Can you just recap a little bit for the folks who weren't there about what happened? And, and, and give kind of a, a, I guess, probably more people on the panel were, were there we, as well. I think we were all there. Everybody was there. Everybody was there. Okay. Second time in 12 hours, we're all seeing each other. Welcome back, everybody. Yeah, well, um, well, was anyone not at the hearing? No. Well, let's give, let's give a quick recap. Um, if, you know, um, maybe yeah. Nancy yeah. and Sherry could do two minutes. Yeah, okay. I just I just want to say, I mean, I, I think this problem has been studied extensively, extensively, and we've had two hearings. This was the second hearing because there was a bill last year, so we had a seven-hour hearing in November, and we had another one of nearly the same length yesterday. Um, we Everyone has has been heard. Um, I see Shula Warren here, who is the chief <laughs> staff for Gail Brewer. Um, honestly, I think, I think I think Gail must have met with a hundred <laughs> businesses and concerned people. We have met with people all over the city. We've been to every community board meeting. I think that we know so much about this issue at this point that we really don't need another study. And I just also want to give a plug to the Community Service Society that's been doing these surveys for eight years and mm -hmm. are extremely well respected. Somebody from the Institute for Women's Policy Research testified yesterday and said it's, it's an incredibly well respected study, has been, their, their methodology is flawless and there is no reason to be skeptical of the study. In any event, the hearing last yesterday was, was very extensive. There were panels of um, workers and people who have studied the problem. Uh, who are in favor of um, of, the, of this um, legislation? Uh, there was somebody from there were there were representatives of small business, um, represented from the Women's Chamber of Commerce, which represents a thousand to fifteen hundred, I think. I actually, she said fifteen hundred um, businesses, small businesses owned by women, who testified in favor of this bill because it's good for business. It's good. Um, it's good for the good businesses to have a level playing field. Um, and uh, there were there were other business owners who were there and testified as well. And as I said, many workers and people who've studied the problem. 
um, and public health experts were there to talk about the impact on public health, which we haven't talked about. I and mean, this is a work family issue for sure, but it's also a public health issue for all of us in New York. And uh, Victor Seidel, a Nobel Prize winner in public health, um, talked about how this is just essential. It is important that all people in New York City have paid sick time. So, and, and there was a panel of labor leaders also who talked about labor issues. And, and the, the chambers testified, um, and a number of businesses testified. So that was mm -hmm. the hearing, really. Um, Nancy, did you want to add anything to the description? No, I, I think yesterday? that um, Jerry really gave a, a good overview, and I think from both sides we, we felt it was a very good hearing. I think the only issue that we all have is the way that the hearings are conducted in the sense that when we started out we had, what, close to 20 council members, and yeah. then uh, they all stayed for about an hour, an hour and a half, and then they left. So all the people that give their time and effort and really want to stand up and say whatever they want to say on both sides of the fence That's are not heard. And so, it gets very discouraging. So yeah. by the end of the day, when I think the hearing went to almost seven, seven mm -hmm. there was one, you know, basically the committee chair, and I think Gail, yeah, Gail was there, and that was it. Uh -huh. so, uh, so, so another point, another she point that uh, on which you all agree. So, <laughs> right, okay, that's what we all agree exactly. Okay, so but let's let's talk about the specifics of the legislation. Um, Shabani, are you happy, w content with with what is uh, now before the council? And let's let's uh, summarize. Um, basically, uh, the legislation now would give. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, five days paid sick leave within a year to um, for people who work for businesses that have 19 or fewer employees, right? And for those who have work for businesses that have 20 or more, they would get a maximum of nine, right? That's cool. okay. Um, so, uh, do you are you satisfied with that um, proposal? I'm currently. Rock New York is very happy with the bill um, as it's written. We, we, it's been a long effort of many meetings with the coalition, many meetings um, council member um, brewers had with many organizations. And the way it stands right now, it would be extremely beneficial to restaurant workers around the city and would really set a precedent around the country to what can be done for restaurant workers with this local legislation. Like I said before, our rocks around the country are working on this on the local levels as well. So currently, Rock is, is very happy with the legislation. Okay. Nancy, I know your group has several uh, objections to the legislation. Can we start with your top two? right now. Okay, well, I think the, the first one is still the definition of a small business. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at the Family Medical Leave Act, and if you look at Obama's uh, recent health care proposal, um, a small business, it, which is 50 employees or less, are exempt. A, a small business, you can have 20 employees, and that's a small business. You can have five employees and be a multi-million dollar business in today's world with technology the way it is. So this definition is very, very loosely structured and we think that it should be 50 if this is going and, to And take so it. that, just to clarify, that businesses that have fewer than 50 employees then would not be required to provide any sick time. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay. Um, share. Oh. Well, that was my Okay, was sorry, a, go you, on. You me my two. fault. Uh, and there's a whole laundry list, but I'm trying to really quickly think about what the, what the second one is. The second one is, why five? Why nine? Mm. If, if the Women's um, Policy Institute, which actually did a study and I believe presented it in Washington, because again, we feel that if this is a human rights issue, it should be taken up at the federal level, um, testified that an average person takes four sick paid days a year. Average person across the United States takes four paid sick days a year. Why are we talking about five and nine? Great and question. Even the, even the teachers union in New York City gives five. Okay. Why, why isn't it just one number for all businesses? Sherry, why isn't it one number for all businesses? <laughs> Well, I mean, there, there t uh, let me let me talk about the, the the why on on the why it isn't one number for all businesses is a recognition by um, people who are drafting this legislation um, that small business that although all workers need paid sick days, that small businesses may be may be able to do a little less for their workers than larger businesses. So it's a recognition of what the chamber has been saying that small businesses have a little less wherewithal to um, to provide. Um, paid sick time, they may have less, you know, more problems covering um, 
uh, workers who are out, et cetera. So that's why. Um, that's the why. Um, and, but and but all, I mean, uh, and I think this is really important. Um, we have um, the, the, um, the concentration of workers across the economic spectrum and across the um, business spectrum in terms of size of employers lack paid sick days. It's a problem on, at every level, but it's particularly a problem in, in, with businesses under, under 50, and that would be about half the workers in the city who don't have paid sick days, so, and, and especially for low-income workers in those places. So it would be, it would, it would be a meaningless bill in some sense um, in terms of public health if you carved out those If it people. excluded yes. businesses under yes. 50. Hold on one second. We'll get back to you. Um, Mary, I want to ask you if, um, if things are, uh, if the situation is, is um, notably different for nonprofit organizations as opposed to businesses, which um, Nancy represents. Well, let me just say something about in response to the questions about why the standards and how the how the bill has been mm -hmm. oriented? I mean, I think it there's a there's a pattern of legislation that's been passed in San Francisco and Washington and other legislation that's being considered at the state level, and I think that that the parameters of this bill, you know, closely follow the the, the established practice. And that's not to say that the established practice makes the most sense, um, particularly in the New York City context. So, uh, to the point about you know why five or why nine days or why not a more nuanced bill that I think was was uh, was raised by Nancy. Um, the um, organizations that are struggling to survive in these economic times include a number of nonprofit organizations in New York City, some 29,000 organizations. And the, the paradox of the nonprofit, I think, is somewhat interesting to put on the table here because the story of organizations like this, which are private organizations, um, uh, is often not heard. Um, one of the um, driving missions of you know, most nonprofit organizations is to serve individuals who um, need to receive the kinds of benefits that this bill proposes to provide. And so one of the paradoxes of being a nonprofit is often that uh, the mission of your organization is to provide benefits for the underserved, and at the same time as a small nonprofit organization, you're not able to provide those benefits to your own employees. Um, so what we find is a very interesting dynamic um, where individuals who work in in organizations that serve clients who need services don't often receive those services themselves. And, and that's, um, that's a broad issue, not just including paid sick leave, but also more generally including the ability to provide uh, health care benefits and the ability to provide uh, retirement and pension funds. Um, most nonprofits are very small by definition. Um, uh, small in a nonprofit sector is you know one or two employees, so they're extremely small. Um, so many of those very small nonprofits would be exempted under the provision of this bill. But it's a difficult um, position for organizations to believe in these benefits not to be able to provide them. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, well, Nancy, I know you wanted to say one more thing, and I want to. I'll tack on a question to what you wanted to say. Um, one of the other um, issues I know you've had. Oh, sorry. Sorry. One of the other issues I know you've had with the bill um, have to do with the documentation requirements with it. So when you uh, you say what you want to say, please add on what you're what you're um, what you're unhappy with in terms of the documentation documentation requirements. Right. Well, um, the, I was really um, going to respond to the fact that yes, we know that that there there are health issues. But our Department of Health, I, 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 we all know that New York City does not have a Department of Labor. However, New York City does have a Department of Human Rights. New York City does have a Department of Health that licenses all restaurants. New York City does have a Department of Consumer Affairs, which licenses and works with retailers. So if some of these issues that we're dealing with are issues having to do with health, or human rights, then can we not try to strengthen the laws and give the ability to our currently existing departments in those arenas the ability to stand up and to help and to make sure that employees are treated fairly? Um, and it, I, I totally understand, and we all felt very badly for those employees that spoke yesterday and talked about their trials and tribulations. And one of the questions that we had was, what happened to disability? Why didn't disability kick in to these folks that had 
long term. Uh, well, but what about the people with shorter term issues? Like if you have well, a, if you have food poisoning, that's not going to qualify as a disability. No, right? I understand. But the other there were two other uh, folks that had testified, and they did have longer terms. But so, I guess I'm I'm more interested in if you're if you're talking about uh, these other agencies within the city, how would they address and you know what we're what we're talking about the need for uh, you know sick time in the immediate. Right. Well, one of the city council members yesterday pointed out that um, that the New York City Department of Health, which I didn't have time to go and make sure that he's correct, does have a, a food handling uh, law that someone that's sick is not supposed to be handling food. Right. But if uh, certainly they ought not to be. But if they have no choice but to be at work, then what, what, what's how do you solve that? Well, how do you solve that problem? Able, they should be able to complain. To the Department of Health, that their employer is not is not following the law. But the law, but if the law, I mean, you can put rubber gloves on, and you know, and and still, it doesn't solve the whole problem. Like there's part, there's the health problem, but then there's also the problem of having sick people at work, and and then. You well, know. that's what that's what I'm saying. Strengthen the department's laws and rules and regulations. Again, I'm not an expert in that, so I can't really comment on it. But just from a logical standpoint, if we've already got these departments in place, and again, I'm not, I'm not talking about the sick leave right now. I'm talking about the human rights issue. If we have these departments in place that are licensing and handling the regulations for restaurants, any any type of food handlers, then why can't we strengthen those regulations and let an employee we go and complain just like they do with the inspectors that go out from the health department to the restaurants and now we're giving them letter grades based on the following of the laws and the um, safety and cleanliness of the restaurant. Okay, can you, um, let, let's move on from that I think. Okay. 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 Um, can you tell me what your issue is with the documentation requirements in the bill? Well, the documentation requirements are, are, are actually just another burden for the small businesses to have to keep track of all these different. What are they exactly? What are the documentation requirements that would be a burden? Well, I, I'm not involved with all the details of documentation requirements, but the issue, one of the issues is we, we have of the documentation is that we can't ask for documentation. The bill states that if you are out three days in a row, we cannot ask you for sick for documentation from a doctor that you've been sick until the fourth day. So, May, okay. uh, and, excuse me, mm -hmm. but back to that same thing about a sick worker. If you are a restaurant, you are not allowed to have, nor do you want a worker who's sick to be involved with food. So if you're out sick today and you come back tomorrow, I can't ask you for documentation. You might still be sick and I don't want you to be there, but we're not allowed to ask for documentation. Mary, is that fair? Uh, well, I think, that, is that fair? Uh, well, you're nodding and, your head the question that is, you have an opinion on that. I think the that. question is fair to whom? So yes. I think that's really mm -hmm. what's at issue here. Um, I think if you look at the issue in general, um, you know, do you need more oversight or legislation in this area? I think all of us may agree that um, it is necessary, especially I think there was a movement in this area on the H1N1 issue last year um, that um, said that, you know, the spread of those kinds of, of um, pandemic, potentially pandemic diseases um, needed to be addressed by uh, paid sick leave. Um, I think we probably all agree that it's fair to have paid sick leave um, in that uh, the workers need it, that they deserve it, that it's not fair that individuals who have higher income have access to it, and that employers want more satisfied workers and they want workers who have more okay, flexibility. Okay, pause for one second. Nancy, do you agree with everything she just said? Absolutely. Okay. But is it feasible, I think, is where, well, we're, that, where we are in this debate about mm -hmm. can we do it and for whom and under what circumstances and at what cost? So I think the feasibility is the issue of, you know, who should pay and who should have to do it and who should provide it, I think, is where we don't that, have consensus. Well, that's where we're going, right. I think, with this conversation. Um, what, one last question about the nitty-gritty of the bill. Um, right now, it uh, doesn't specify which agency would administer it. Um, why does that matter, if anyone thinks it matters? Well, I think it's it's something that's being discussed now by the council. I, I it, it We need to obviously have an agency that enforces the... the uh, the bill. Um, we don't have a Department of Health in New York City. Um, we do. 
I mean, I'm sorry, we don't have a Department of Labor in New York City. We have a Department of Health. Department of Health is fairly overburdened, but yes. Um, so, you know, there are a number of agencies, um, many of which Nancy just mentioned, that could probably take this on. Um, I just I just want to be clear, though, in terms of the Department of Health regulations, um, if somebody's sick and they're not going to get paid and, you know, and there's no protection against retaliation, you cannot depend on the worker uh, to, um, to, to be the one to meet these Department of health regulations that mm -hmm. that's just we, and when, I mean it just right. isn't, it's not going to happen do you have that's any the problem do you have any response to her point about that the employers aren't able to ask for documentation should you know is that yeah. not a fair the, request the three-day document that is something that is an average I mean that's in the Healthy Families Act at the federal mm -hmm. level there's been some analysis of what what generally work um, you know uh, businesses ask for in terms of documentation and three days seems to be the rule and there were a lot of questions yesterday of of business owners, how many days do you, before you ask for documentation? Three was what almost everybody said. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's three. Um, I, you know, that, 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 that's the answer to that question. I think the other, the other issue is, you know, if somebody has a cold, especially a low income worker or, or the flu even, um, they don't have the money to go to the doctor. So, you know, if you're out for a day or two, um, it doesn't seem fair to a worker to have to go to a doctor and get a certification. It's expensive. So that's, you know, so that's the balance. Yes, we are trying to make a balance between. Okay. Well, work, thanks you know, for spelling that out. I, it does seem like the next issue that we all have to tackle is um, the cost of this to businesses, to employees, the cost in general. So, Nancy, <clears throat> why don't you start out by uh, letting us know what you think the cost would be to businesses? Okay, um, we know that the, um, that yesterday was brought up that the Department of Labor released a study that said that on average it's going it, uh, on average it's 23 cents um, per hour per worker um, for uh, most industries except the service industry is an average of eight eight cents. Mm -hmm. um, however, I can I can quote you from businesses here in the city who have calculated based on the current bill what some of the costs would be. And I think I can just, I will talk about City Hall Restaurant since we're talking about the restaurant industry. Mm -hmm. um, he has a staff of 45 full and part-time employees and under the current bill, of course, he'd have to be paying nine paid sick days. And it was gonna cost him over $60,000 annually to comply with this. Um, and also, I, well, I think I have another restaurant here. Sorry, because I can't remember all these I'm off the top of my head. Um, but the, the, the point is, even if, it's, even if it's eight cents an hour, that's $500 per employee uh, per mm -hmm. year. So that would be, if you, had a, if you had a business of 25, that would be $12,000 a year in extra cost mm -hmm. for a 25 person business. And I can go on, as I say, and quote you, even at St. John's University in Staten Island estimated it's gonna cost over $101,000 mm -hmm. um, for them to to put this together. And again, I could just go on and quote numbers. Okay. Um, and so so just to be clear, you're not disputing the Department of Labor numbers, you're just no. saying that that right. some businesses have different numbers and even using their numbers, it's a significant amount right. of money. Right. And I think you have to understand as well that the Department of Labor has taken these numbers from the entire country. This is not just from New York City. So those that are, are being paid in Amarillo, Texas, are thrown into the mix, and certainly Amarillo, Texas is very different from New York City. So you have to bear that in mind when we look at national numbers, which is, again, why we also feel, as does uh, uh, our um, uh, associates here, that it is a national issue, and it should be dealt with at a federal Okay, level. we will come to that. Okay. Um, Mary, what about these costs. Um, first of all, what, I mean, do we need to think, are, are our numbers different from what the Department of Labor thinks because we're in New York or for any other reason? And, um, and how do we, how do we approach these costs? Are they, you know, um, do the costs outweigh the benefits, I guess, is part of what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, that's a difficult question to know the answer to, um, as all these are. Um, the, the President's Council on Economic Advisors just released in March a report on work-life balance and the economics of workplace flexibility, and they've made some estimates about the cost and benefits of a variety of workplace um, 
um, provisions, including the idea of paid sick leave. Um, the, the challenge is that you can estimate how much the increased cost might be per hour for, um, for wages to an employer, but it's harder to estimate what the benefits are on the, on the benefit side. So, for because example... Because they're, they're not uh, quantifiable, they're not numbers and money, or because... Well, because turnover, for example, so firing employees and hiring new ones, you know, is a cost to an employer. Um, the ability to um, find individuals who um, who are more motivated and, and according to this uh, president's report, are more um, um, satisfied and more committed to the employer, you know, is supposed to be increased with additional um, benefits and with reduction of absenteeism. So the, the benefits side is hard to measure. And Many of the benefits come at the societal or the social good level, not necessarily at the individual employer's level. So there are costs and there are benefits. Um, and I think one thing that really needs to be put on the table is, you know, what are the various mechanisms to consider you know, providing resources to address this kind of issue? So there are different kinds of ways that uh, different um, states and localities have looked at ways to help underwrite the cost to employers. So things potentially like a, um, um, a tax credit for employers who pay for paid leave, um, the idea that perhaps independent savings accounts should be established. This is part of the New York State uh, pending bill. Um, so independent savings accounts that could pay for it, um, whether or not to use temporary or state disability funds, uh, California used state disability money. So I think the question is on the cost benefits, you know, who's going to share in those costs and whether or not it should be the benefit, it should be the responsibility of the uh, employer themselves without any um, government uh, so resources is the question. Can I inter uh, interrupt sure. for one second? So just to be clear, we're talking here in New York City about an employer uh, funded, uh, you know, that it would come out of them. And you were saying in other uh, instances, um, it's also had some government and taxpayer money in, uh, to, to offset it or, or to help out employers, or it, has it ever been solely the source of it's, funding? It's both. So in California, for example, at the state level, um, they created an in increased uh, tax that was used to um, fund more money in the temporary disability fund. So they, um, they provided more opportunities for temporary disability money. Um, in New York, in the bill that's pending, there's the idea of um, creating these independent savings accounts that could help to um, offset the costs um, for the employers. But can, and and let me ask one more credit. question. Mm -hmm. So now, in most of uh, the cases in which this is passed, it has been entirely employer funded. Is that correct? I can't speak for most. The actual Sherry? number is small. Sharon, can I just, I, I just Please. need to make, I really need to make this point because it is a, a source of confusion. Um, Paid family leave, which is funds long-term people out for oh, yes. uh, the birth of a child, a serious illness of a family member, um, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, is our bill actually in New York, 12 weeks. No one expects an employer to pay for that themselves. Nobody expects the government to pay for that. Ordinary sick leave, one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, a year, in a calendar year, for, for flu. That's, that is not covered, that is first of all not covered by those programs, serious illness only, or birth of a child. And second of all, has always, always, always been the cost of doing business, just like paying the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, you know, being out sick, I mean basically what, what employers are, are really saying, those that provide it, are, we're not going to dock you. We're not going to reduce your annual wage because you're sick a day. So it's always been the cost of, and you know, the, the, when you say 23 cents or eight cents, you know, if you thought of that as a minimum wage addition, nobody would blink. So it's really not, it, and, and you know, I don't know, we've been focusing very much on the numbers of people who don't have paid sick days, but there are so many employers who do provide it and have always provided it. And there, you know, that may be going down, which is a cause for alarm, but it is a cost of doing business, and it always has been. The paid family leave issue is a different issue, yeah, and, it's, so and, and, and a much more expensive one. So, Mary, I guess I misunderstood you. In terms of uh, models for paid sick leave, this has not been applied to short-term uh, right. short short okay. arrangements, as Sherry says. So, um, every in every instance, it has been employer-funded that's happened so far. In the instances in, in San Francisco and D.C., that's correct. Yes. Okay. No, but, but again... No, no, it's it's not. Uh, it's not. That's what we try to and, do. And we, we, we call it sick time in our act. But um, it's New Jersey, you, 
it's long term. Uh, it's, it's in the long term disability program, the TDI pro, their TDI program, like our TDI program, like California's TDI program. It's for long term illness. There is a waiting period before you can even access the money. So if you have a couple days off, you're not going to get any of that money. It's an insurance program, as it should, as it, as it needs to be, because there's really, I don't, I can't think of any other way to fund it. I, if anyone else has ideas, great. But um, you can't put that burden on employers, and you can't really put that burden on the government. And so that's why it's been that's why it's been an insurance program. Okay, Chibani, I say, hold on. I'll, Nancy and then Chibani. Okay. No, I was just going to say that this is one of the issues that we are discussing, that the potential of having a bill like this that is totally footed on the backs of the business community, where some of them because of the language in the bill, it's not clear. If I have and give my employees two weeks vacation. I give them two weeks vacation days, and I don't call in on the sick days. If I give my employee two weeks vacation days, does that also count so that I don't have yes. to now it add an it additional? Does. Yes. It does. Make it yes. time. It does. That, it, that's been such a hard thing to well, get across. Please, please That's a hard thing to get road. across because yes. it is not clearly Well, this is a great moment. This is an important well, communication between you two. This is the Fine. issue. I mean, I, I, there's no intent, Nancy, no intent at all to make good employers who give time off dedicate sick time or add sick time. No, no, no. Nine days, five days, that's it. That's all you have to, if your employer can use it for sick, fine, no problem. You're, not that you're out you're of the, the bill, hook. it's not a carve out, but you meet the standards of the bill. Okay, okay. Well, we have to clarify it in the bill, and pr pr frankly, this is part of the problem. It's not necessary that, necessarily that we disagree with every point in the bill. It's that the way the bill is written is open to interpretation. And who's well, going to make the money? The lawyers. The employees are not. I'm <laughs> telling you. Well, that's for sure. Well, I, feel like I feel like this, this was an important bill. moment between <laughs> the two of you. I well, like I, we just, just let me say, it's the same language that was, it's the same language that's in San Francisco, and the same well, language that you see in Milwaukee and in, in the Healthy Family. But, 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 but now, smarter. But, <laughs> okay, but Nancy, I hear what you were saying in the first part, which is that basically you think this is on the backs of employers. And Shabani, I'm going to turn this to you because, you know, the restaurant industry, everybody hears about restaurants going out of business all the time. They operate on razor thin margins. Why should they be expected to handle this cost? Why should this be the cost of their doing business? Well, first of all, restaurants are the largest private sector employer in the country. Write that down, remember it, and take it home. That's 14.7 million folks that are working in the industry, largely women, largely immigrants, and largely people of color. So that means a lack of paid sick time goes directly to that community. And then in terms of cost, I can speak to that too. We, um, one of the things we do at Rock is we not only organize restaurant workers, we organize employers as well. We have a round table of good employers who provide these kind of benefits, <laughs> living wages, so on and so forth. Um, I can give you two examples that are actually very close by, one if by land, two if by sea restaurant, and Lapa Lapa restaurant. Both are outstanding employers, uh, promote from within, give benefits, and give sick time. And one of the things we're currently doing is we're starting a high road research project to actually nettle out the costs, which is going to be a longer process. But I will speak to these restaurants. Lapa Lapa has had the same workforce for almost 10 years, no turnover. One if by land, they have someone who started as a dishwasher who is now one of the general managers. I think these kind of practices speak very deeply. And then I can talk about my own parents' business, which is actually not in Amarillo, Texas, but Houston, Texas. Um, my parents own a small pipe fittings place. My two parents, and they have three employees that have been there forever. They give a bank of leave time, actually. So if this were to happen in Texas, one would hope. Um, they give about 10 days off to their employees paid. They can take from that. This would not affect them. They're on board, too. But, but, <coughs> but what about the, the, just specifically about, you know, the, the thin margins? What are the things that the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce has said is that, you know, we're in these tough economic times, and this is going to hurt the workers that you guys want to protect because it's going to um, mean the loss of jobs? What do you say to that? I say that's what people always say when there's any sort of regulation that's going to happen. If you look back to when FDR was president, <laughs> everything was, this is going to kill the economy, this is going to hurt jobs. 
Our response to that is what we call the prosperity framework when it comes to restaurant workers. Restaurant workers, again, largest private sector employer in the country, most employees, when they're treated well, when they have benefits, it goes directly back in the, into the economy. Restaurant workers are the best tippers, the best, the, they spend the most at restaurants. Guess what they do after their shifts, folks? <laughs> they go to other restaurants. <laughs> so I, I feel like that's sort of, uh, you know, wage-based and benefits-based economy stimulus is the actual stimulus that we're missing in our economy. Can, can okay. I just say yeah. one quick thing? And, mm -hmm. and I do appreciate what you're saying about the great restaurants um, that do give the great benefits, but I, I think we have to back up for one second. Those restaurant workers and that dedication of those workers to one if by land is not just based on the fact that they're giving them some paid sick days. It's on their treatment totally. So that's something we have to always remember too. It's the full benefit package. It's the, it's the way that they're treated. It's not just the fact that they have some paid sick days. So we need to keep that in mind as well. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, one of the things um, you alluded to earlier, Nancy, was the idea that this should be handled nationally. And I wonder if this isn't a point we all also on some level might agree with. Um, that there ought to be um, national paid sick leave legislation. Sherry, what do you think about that point? Oh, totally. I, I totally <laughs> agree with it. Um, if you look at most of the many of the labor, most of the labor benefits actually that we have in this country, though, um, they started out um, at the local level, local mm -hmm. minimum wage, state minimum wage. The federal, the national government sometimes has to be pushed and um, and has to and has to know it can work. Honestly, because yep. it is harder to enact something on a national level. Well, let's let's look for a moment internationally, as okay. I like to do. Um, do we have ev any evidence from abroad that this can work? <laughs> 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 well, it, it you know, as you alluded to in your 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 remarks, um, we are an outlier uh, in terms of providing paid leave for our workers. Um, we, uh, there are 145 countries in the world that, re that guarantee paid sick days. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, so, uh, and are they doing okay? And they, they, uh, many of them are, some of them are. <laughs> some of them are. Um, and um, in terms of the developed countries, in terms of paid family leave, just that's a different issue, as yes. I say, but um, there is no other developed country that has no paid family leave. So, um, you know, we, I, though, and those those countries do manage to. In fact, you know, I think that there are there are a lot of studies that they do extremely well, and that their workforce is um, is more consistent, and that there is less turnover, okay. and that they keep women in the job market, which is, I think, a very important point right. to make in this day and age. Mm -hmm. So, um, so back to the national context then. So there is, of course, uh, paid sick time legislation pending on the national level. Shouldn't we, should we just wait for that? Um, or, you know, and what are the prospects of that? Anybody ha um, have, Sherry, uh, well, again, want to tell us how, the, I mean, how we're doing me, on the national level? Let me just say, level? say again that if you talk to the people who have sponsored the bill on the national level, and we have, and we had uh, Donna Dolan, who's here today mm -hmm. from the Paid Leave Coalition, read a letter yesterday from Senator Dodd, who stepped in as co-sponsor of the Healthy Families Act from Senator Kennedy, who, um, who originated it. Um, s urging New York City to please pass paid sick days mm -hmm. because the more local um, bills that there are, the more likely it is to happen at the national level. And okay. and and there is some feeling that it won't happen in the national level until there's there are some. There's so some there's like a critical mass that has to happen. New York has been ahead of the nation on so many issues. Ahead of the nation on the treatment of uh, individuals based on sexual orientation and on a variety of other categories. So it seems to me that New York should be a first mover in this area, not wait for the nation to take it on. What do you think, Nancy? Well, I, I, I respectfully disagree with that, um, simply from the fact that, number one, if, if New York City enacts a, an, a, a law to this effect on their own, then maybe White Plains will enact a different act, or maybe somebody out in Long Island will enact a different act. Or maybe somebody in New Jersey will. It's it could be massively confusing. And if we enact confusing, a law, how? I mean, if you work for one employer, the laws of your locality apply to them. No, because you can have a, a national employer who has policies that have to affect every single solitary employee. So that's mm. also a challenge for a nationwide employer, like a Verizon or an AT and T or someone like that. So that's an issue. But what I'm really getting at is that if we enact a law in New York City 
then they enact a law in Washington, then we're going to have to change all of our laws to, to follow through with what's enacted in Washington. If we enact a law in New York City now, a business in Queens can move 50 feet over the Queens line to Long Island and not have to pay this kind of money and take the jobs with them. They can go to New Jersey. They can go to White Plains. Enacting a law does not level the playing field. But for, for for us. do you think that will realistically? Do we think that will happen for a difference of twelve thousand dollars? We've, we've had going to uproot their business and we've move had some, over the border. We've had some of our uh, businesses who have testified to that. Um, and yesterday, another person's moving his business to Arizona. Tom Scarangello from Locks from Staten. I know he was a little over the top. Uh, even passed. Arizona. I agree with that. Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> but but the the fellow from Staten Island said he'll just he lives in Long Island. He'll just up and go there. So this is unlike other things that have been discussed. And I think one of the things we all have to remember here is that. Every law, even the smoking law, which sometimes we refer to, every law, everything that has been enacted in New York City has never in the history of the city been really a, a rousing negative reaction from the business community. We have 29 different business organizations from the New York City Partnership all the way down to the New York Staffing Association, the, the Real Estate Board of New York, bids, chambers. We have never in the history of New York City had such an adverse reaction to any bill well, from the business community at the city council level. And that goes to show you how these businesses are really, really struggling and scared to death that the more that we keep putting burdens on their backs solely, the more they're going to lose the jobs and have to close their doors. Well, and tell me, tell me, <laughs> and well, go ahead. And if I could just make one more point, and and uh, again, um, this is all in the spirit of, of openness and fairness. Um, the San Francisco bill has been referred to several times, and at the hearing in um, the fall. Uh, we heard from the Department of Labor, um, and she had said that there's no reaction, um, and there's been no adverse reaction. Now, granted, we know that San Francisco was dealing with three things at once, a, a, a wage increase, um, the uh, this uh, law that was passed with regard to paid uh, sick days, and there was another issue, I don't remember. Health care. Health care, thank you very much. Um, and we talked to the San Francisco Chamber three weeks ago and the San Francisco area has 500,000 jobs, and in the last 18 months, they've lost 47,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, is that all in reaction to the paid sick day legislation? No, but it's like what we're all saying, it's the combination of everything put on the backs of the small business. You know how many taxes the small business pays? Do you know how many permits? No one is looking at the full burden of everything on the small business. We're taking it okay. one off. Now it's family, uh, it's paid sick leave. Then it was the smoking ban. Then it's this and it's the burden of all these things. And that's why we're walking around the city and looking at stores that are closing, looking well, at restaurants okay. that are closing. You have a supporter. Well, I feel, <laughs> I feel like we should talk practically now because as I understand it, and please correct me if, you, if I'm wrong, um, there's a lot of momentum now and I think something is likely to pass and probably pass soon. So um, soon, before soon. then, it sounds like there may be some changes made. Let's talk about, um, is there anything, uh, what changes, you know, is there any version of this legislation you would be happy with or just any passage of anything is a travesty to you? Is there any any way that you could, you could make this, you know, any, if you had to have a change, one, could you live with it? Are you talking In, to me? Yes, I'm oh, talking so to you, Nancy. <laughs> sorry. Absolutely. I mean, look, you have to understand that the five borough chambers in our alliance are not in favor of anyone being fired if they're sick. We are not. We are totally in agreement on that. And and as Mary had said, it's the methodology to get to root out those bad employers to fix this. We cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater which is really what this bill does. But Sherry has clarified something which we need to clarify in the language so that it will be less onerous for companies if I already give 
a vacation, I just don't call it paid sick days. If, if, I'm, still, if I'm still not going to be affected by this bill, that's a whole other story. But we have suggested several points in the bill. We have, a, a, we have a laundry list that we have shared with all of the city council members, and we know right now Gil Brewer is back working on changing some of the language. So sorry. this bill is not as it is. I'm sorry, one second. Yeah, sorry. This bill is not going to be voted on as it is. We know there are language changes, and, and we're, we're really looking forward to participating in that. And the one thing that we really, again, are going to keep emphasizing, which is probably going to be the sticking point, is do not, if this is going to be enacted, do not put the burden solely on the backs of businesses and figure out a way to have a shared cost, just as workers' comp, just as other other issues, so it's kind of an insurance program. So it's not on the back of the sure, business. Sherry, can you imagine any changes to this legislation um, that you could live with? Sure, in, there, that would, sure. There were, you know, there were some. Make. There were definitely some things that were mentioned yesterday, and you know, Nancy suggests that there could be clarification on the language. I, I like it, but if uh, on you know guaranteeing that BTO and and vacation whatever can be used if it's in the same amount for the same purposes. Uh, we're, I mean, I, you know, I know that Gail is open to um, changes, and I'm, I'm sure that, that everyone is. Um, there's some bottom lines, though, and, and one of them is that, that all workers need to be covered. All private sector workers do need to be covered, and I think that's important. I think it's important that um, this apply to taking care of your children as well as taking care of yourself and, um, you know, with, with and, and your elderly parents be with women in the workforce. It's really critical that that be the case. Um, and um, so I think I think that there are some bottom lines for us as well, or for the um, for the coalition. But um, there's certainly things we heard yesterday that could be clarified. There's no no doubt about it. Um, I just I also want to just in terms of San Francisco and the job loss. I just you know we are in a recession. Everybody knows that it's a you know and 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 I think there's been job loss around the country. Um, there was a study by the Drum Major Institute about surrounding counties as opposed to San Francisco. And I just want to point out that San Francisco did, has done, fared much better in the recession than the surrounding counties, which do not have paid sick time uh, bills. So I, d I just want to make that point so, as well. And, and so if, uh, as I ha have heard, this is actually likely to um, pass in some form soon, it seems like one of the possible outcomes is that um, as the mayor hasn't been very enthusiastic about it, it might pass and then not be implemented. Um, is, do, does that strike you as a possibility, and what if that happens, is there to be done? Well, I, I think one of the things that um, oh, obviously we're all looking at faced at not only the city, the state, but federal level as well is our funds. We don't have the funds. This bill was enacted in Washington, D.C., and they have yet to uh, be able to enforce it because they don't have the funds to set up the department to run it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, one of the issues with our city is we haven't even decided which department's going to run it, and we just heard the mayor saying he's cutting 11,000 jobs. How are we now going to enact this? And, and it's silly to enact a bill if it's not going to be able to be enforced. Who's going to pay for that enforcement? That's another huge issue that no one's talking about. We um, don't have the money in the city right now. Sherry, who should pay for enforcement? Well, I mean, I think that I think that is something that does need to be worked out. I mean, I think it, it, it you know, it's a true issue. It's not a false issue. Um, but there are departments um, that currently have um, administrative mechanisms that that could be adapted here. So I, you know, I think there probably is some cost to implementation. But I don't, it shouldn't be a huge cost. Um, there's you know, people are talking about the Department of Consumer Affairs, the Human Rights Commission, which is uh, how Milwaukee has has decided to implement. Um, so there are, and those agencies have um, administrative mechanisms both for investigation and for taking complaints. And so I, I'm not really involved in those. I think the council is looking at that. Um, but there, there are, there are definitely ways to, um, to, to, to implement and enforce. And I think that has to be discussed. Okay. Did you have something to add, Bonnie? No. Yeah. Okay. Paying attention. Um, all right. Well, I think we can open the. Um, did you, Mary? Anyone else? Okay. I think we can open uh, this discussion up uh, to the audience. If anybody has questions, um, we're going to pass a microphone around. Uh, looks like we have a few questions. Hang on one sec. Oh, you want to? Is it there? Here it comes. Here comes Mike. Oh, we have two. I get it. Okay, Brad. 
Thanks. Uh, my question is about implementation of the bill as it is. Uh, my name is John Jefferson. I work for AT&T. And uh, it, right now it doesn't exclude any businesses because of the non-specificity in the language about the offset if you already provide sick days or paid time off. And that might be taken care of. But um, there's also a burden of tracking and operational costs implicit in the bill. Uh, because it has a provision that says if a worker spends 80 hours or more within the city of New York doing their job, no matter where they're headquartered in the region or the country or the world, then they have to uh, be part of the provisions of this bill. So when I talk to peers in other large corporations like Con Ed that send workers within the city limits um, on emergency work or Verizon or American Airlines that have people deadheading here or coming here and working for a while, you know, going on to their next flight. You know, it's how, how do you track that for every worker? And then the interesting thing is um, you live in Nassau County and you come and you work in New York City and you get to this 80 hours a week and you're, you know, anybody who's a an IT person, a programmer knows what a nightmare that, you know, trying to calculate how to, how to track that. But then where do you take your sick time? Because when you're in Nassau and you're sick, you're not under any kind of jurisdiction of New York City. So you have to come into New York City while you're sick to take your sick time off. And those kind of things, you know, just drive legal counsel crazy at a large corporation that has to look at this kind of bill and say, was this really well thought out? So my question is, that specific provision, could it go away? And if it doesn't, how do we implement it? And does that exist in, uh, say, Washington or San Francisco? Yeah, it, it kind of has to. I mean, you have to have some, it doesn't have to be 80 hours, but it, you have to have some, con you have to have some contact with New York City to be covered. Um, you can't, we can't legislate in the city council um, for workers from other places, that's not. But we can have a threshold connection, and that's what that is. It's a threshold connection. It doesn't have to do with how you're accruing the leave. You just, whether or not you're covered, come, you know, it, it, you have to have at least 80 hours. Um, you know, that's, um, I think, in, uh, San Francisco actually has fewer hours. I think it's 40. Um, and um, I think Milwaukee is also 40. So we, we made it higher in New York, actually. Um, and it, how do they handle it in those localities? Do you have any sense of, of, yeah, of I mean, those complications come up that he's describing? This has come up. I mean, it's um, most businesses do track. Um, there are different. There are lots of different ways in which cities have have regulations or um, you know uh, uh, regulate people who work within their boundaries and um, that are different from the way other places do. And that's true. Uh, uh, San Francisco, for example, has a living wage that's much higher than their surrounding counties. So. Um, if you work in, you know, the, the work you do in San Francisco, you have to, you know, you, so people, the businesses and the multinational businesses, or not the multinational, the, the, you know, national businesses keep track. They keep track because there are, um, there are lots of regulations that apply to workers in the city that don't apply other, to other workers outside sure. the city. So you're in Westchester County, you get sick, you've done your 80 hours, your company's tracked it probably manually because it's very difficult uh, with our IT to track it in San Francisco. Um, so you get your, to your 80 hours, you're, you're sick, um, you call your boss, you're in Westchester County, you call your boss, she says, okay, well, where are you? And you say, I'm in Westchester County. Does the law cover you in Westchester County? Is New York expanding its jurisdiction to where with this specific clause to wherever the worker is? Well, you're just, you're accruing your sick time for the hours worked in New York. So where do you take the sick time? If well, you live outside of the city? <laughs> okay, is that in New York? If it's not in New York City, you're allowed to take it? And does that expand the jurisdiction of the City Council of New York? Don't you pay New York City taxes? If you're working in New York City, you go home at night to Nassau, a bunch of stuff there. But as long as you're in New York City working. Well, we have some lawyers, maybe they should answer, because I don't think I'm getting a good answer. Well, I, think <laughs> I, I, don't know what, I don't know what you want the answer to be. I mean... 
<laughs> this is somebody headquartered somewhere else. They I live mean, somewhere AT&T else. How do they take the time? it functions in, in San Francisco as well. And they have detailed, I mean, this is also, it's, it's really, you're talking about a statute, OK? I mean, I'm, I, I assume you're not a lawyer. You're talking about a statute. Presumably, when this is enacted, there will be regulations. That's what happened in San Francisco. It's a very broad, you know, this is, this is the connection to the city. And then we will, you know, the, the regulatory agency has put out regs that are very detailed on how to treat those, the answers to those questions, okay? The statute itself if you, uh, is, is, this is the connection, this is when you're covered. And you accrue, you don't accrue the hours outside of New York City, only in right. New York City, and right. only in San Francisco, and only in Milwaukee, and only in DC. So how that, how that then is, is utilized, um, it's, it's, it's really um, a question of the regulations. And that's, that's, I believe in San Francisco, that yes, if you get sick, you can take, you can take those hours. Um, no matter where you are. That's how, they're, that's how they're implementing it. Now, the regulatory process is such that people can answer, you know, that, 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 that you can comment and you can say, this is how my company works, how shall I do it? I mean, you can, you can have input. Um, it's hard to do those kinds of detailed things for every company in a statute, which is broader, okay? So that, that's, that would be my answer. Great, okay. Mike, uh, thank you, yeah. So let's, we've got two questions over here. Okay. Hello, my name is Walter Yee, and I'm just a working stiff. Uh, before I get to my points about the sick leave thing, I just want to say that I have this, idea, I, this vision of an ideal society where there's so many jobs available, an employee don't get along with an employer, or as Ms. Patel says, employee's pregnant and, and the employee is mean to her, they could all just say, hey, take this job and shove it. I just go literally across, across the street and get another job. Heck with you. Now, how could you have all these jobs? I think Nancy pointed out all these restrictions that government makes difficult to create jobs. And she just pointed out just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, in New York City, we have the so-called uh, Department of Consumer Affairs and the TLC, Taxi Limitization Limousine Commission. Ostensibly, they're there to protect consumers, but they're really there to, to cartelize, to protect the people who are in, inside already, who are in the business. Uh, you need a, a medallion to get a taxi. I think it's $200,000. They, they, they clamp down on, on uh, gypsies. You know, this is a very simple job to get into. You just hire yourself as a cop, but the government says no. Anyway, um, so the idea is that government get out of the way of people to create jobs and make opportunities for themselves, okay? That's how we could decide what is this dissension and conflicts. Uh, <clears throat> as for my ideas about the, uh, my question about the uh, sick leave thing, I work for an organization, uh, a large organization. We have uh, something like 596,000 employees, okay? We, that counts the CEO to the uh, entry level. And we've always had a, uh, a sick leave program. Uh, Predictably, as uh, Nancy said, uh, we, we have one that says that you're allowed to use three days of sick leave without being asked for a note. And predictably, we use three days. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, the rules of using this, we earn, for every 20 hours of work we do, we earn one hour sick leave. Okay, so we have normally 2,000 hours, 2,008 hours of, of work time, we earn 100.4 hours of sick leave a year, that's like 12 and a half days. Now, calculate this amount of 596,000 employees, this equals to 61,984,000 hours of work, of, of sick leave time, okay? And let's say a nominal medium wage of $25 an hour, this represents a total benefit package of 1,549,000, uh, $549,600,000. This is a liability that our company would have to pay if every employee were to take that sick leave in one year. Uh, so this is one of the costs. Now, this hours is a very large organization. However, thankfully, not everyone takes their sick leave. Uh, I am privy to management communications. And, and would it, uh, get the question first. Okay, um, uh, wait a minute. I'm, uh, okay, uh, management communications, we're saying that they're saying that people are abusing their sick leave, and sick leave is one of the biggest costs that this company has to pay, and we are hemorrhaging billions of dollars a year. Okay, so the enforcement part says, okay, the management comes in and says, 
to each employee, hey, look, you're taking too many days. And then people say, hey, I'm not. And then next time, next thing you know that when taking our sick leave, they're giving us a disciplinary letter of warning. Now, we don't want this on your records because uh, the next one would be a suspension, and after that, you get removed. So to fight so, this letter of warning, we have to um, go to union delegates, and we spend hours uh, conf conflicting this, and we go to one, two, three levels, okay, to, to resolve this. So, and so including paying a sick leave, we have this so-called enforcement part where we have to deal with uh, settling these letter of warnings. Okay, the question is, uh, <clears throat> The cost of this program, all right, this is money that the employees have to set, set aside. Uh, where there's 20, 20 hours, 20, hours uh, 20 employees with nine, nine days of sick leave or five, this is money they have to pay. And the enforcement part, uh, I think uh, you're going to set up a new agency to enforce this. You're going to go to every, every company to look at their records, and, and, uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is unbearable. What okay. are you going to do? about enforcement, I, think this, I don't think it's really addressed. And uh, another thing is, there's so many things to be concerned of. Why is the city council even involved with this? Well, you know, I okay. think it seems like a bunch of Thank you for your question. And this thing. Okay. So thank you. All right, we're gonna, uh, one, two, three. Um, so starting there, yes. And you wanna say who you are, please? Yes, um, my name is Donna Dolan, and I chair the New York State Paid Family Leave Coalition. Mm -hmm. And I just, before I ask my question, I just have a comment for the gentleman from AT&T. Um, AT&T's policies are much more generous than this. So AT&T workers shouldn't be concerned about a paid sick days bill because your policies are far more generous. Which is no problem that we're not excluding that. Even though I'm not a lawyer, I'm pointing out. Well. We'll have to take a look at that. Anyway, my question is for Nancy Plosier. Nancy, I can well understand um, the interest in um, the business community conducting their own study. I guess my question is, the first hearing on the paid sick days bill was last November. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering why uh, the business community didn't initiate a study after that first hearing. That's in, a good question. In, no, in we November. Were because I think folks sort of feel that this is a delay tactic at this point. Well, I don't think it's a delay tactic. I think what would happen is that we had the hearing, we started the discussions, and all of a sudden, obviously, I don't think it was anticipated that the business community was going to have such a reaction to this. And when it did, the, the dialogue continued. Then along came the holidays and everything else, and waiting for the reintroduced bill, because all during that time, we went to the city council, to all the members, to council member Brewer, to council member Quinn, and said, look, these are the issues that we have with this bill. And we were told that we were going to be listened to, that things were taken in consideration. So we were waiting to see what the reintroduced bill was and if the language in the bill was such that we could accept it and work under the circumstances. But when this reintroduced bill came out with two major changes, one really, and that was the definition of a small business from 9 to 19, that's when they said, well, wait a minute, this is, they're not hearing us. So now we want to do a study to really get to the root of the problem which is, again, we all don't want bad businesses treating employees poorly. But we need to know the extent of it, who's being affected and which industries. Obviously, we already know the restaurant industry being the biggest employer in, in, in the United States. We know the restaurant and who else? How can we effectively fix this problem without throwing the baby out with the bathwater and affecting all of the good businesses by making them now pay nine paid sick days when they're already giving three or four, which is a huge, tremendous burden and an extra cost to them to do business? I just have one quick follow-up question. Sure. Um, at the November hearing, right. uh, the Community Service Society and a Better Balance study was out then. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if you look at the study, um, which my colleague to my right did, um, it lists the industries that they mm -hmm. studied. So I think mm -hmm. um, everyone was well aware in November who uh, the biggest violators, if you will, right. who the biggest problems were in terms of employers. Mm -hmm. Was there any move on the part 
of the partnership and all of the chambers uh, to get together to work out a plan because you're saying you think they should be policed mm -hmm. and we need to find, identify those bad employers. Was there any discussion at that point about identifying bad employers and doing something about them? Well, the discussion at that point was that we objected to the way the language in the bill. We, we have said from day one that we do not, and we totally agree, that no employee should be fired for, com for calling in sick. We, we all agree from, that, from day one, and we have voiced that. But at that point, we were reacting to what was in the bill. We, we understand what uh, sectors were already uh, talked to, but there was no direct um, conversation about getting to those sectors. We were basically trying to make sure that this bill wasn't passed with this language. That's where our focus was at the time. And in point of fact, we have created secondary language. We have submitted it to, to Christine Quinn and to Gail Brewer, uh, other language that would also help to, to make this a better balanced bill. Um, so to speak. So, no. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so that to answer your question, no. We didn't say, let's go root out these people. What we're saying now is we, we need to, if, if this is going to be an issue, because at that time, you know, we, we understood that people were listening to what we had to say and that there may be changes in the bill or there may not be a bill. So now the bill has been reintroduced. There seems to be momentum. And now we still, we're not delaying. We want to find out exactly the extent. And the, because even if this law is passed, you know a bad business is always going to try to get around it. We need to find who the bad businesses are and try to correct this ahead of time. Because that's, that's the, the focus of this study, is to try to help us get to the point of who is it uh, how extensive is it and how we can fix it with even, again, strengthening some of the current laws that are in, um, in the books, going to the departments that, are, that handle the regulations and the registrations for these businesses, and, and helping them help us make sure that these companies are taken care of. Okay. Um, we have one, two, three. So pass it around. My name's Judy Epstein. I'm a writer. I live on Long Island. And... Um, I uh, came because I found out from Ms. Lerner's website about this, this uh, event today. I just wanted to say to uh, Nancy that, well, to all of you, I, mean, I, I would like to just remind, return to the real world for a moment where everybody gets sick. It's going to happen. It's not the case that you can do a business plan that doesn't involve anybody getting sick. It's also a fact which hasn't been addressed here and I'm only bringing it up that more often than not, it's your mom who brings you to the doctor when you are sick. That's what I do in my day job. I bring people to the doctor. Um, and so it is a women's issue in that half of the sick time women have to take is probably because somebody other than herself is sick. And that's a fact of life too. And trying to plan for any business or any city without re recognizing that is like the story of the guy who designed a cathedral, and the bishop sent it back and said, are they angels? Because it had no bathrooms. Uh, <laughs> it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And what would you want done for yourself is a point I want to introduce. And finally, uh, Nancy, I just wanted to say, <laughs> I have worked in big businesses, and I have worked in some smaller businesses before I left work to be mom. And the effect of having a law like the one that's being talked about protects the business owners, I think, as much as the employees. And I'd just like you to consider that from that point of view. The big companies, they can have their policies, and the rubber doesn't hit the road where you see it. But in a small business, if you want to do the right thing by your employees, maybe you can't because the, the restaurant next to yours, like on Falafel, I mean on, on McDougal Street, where everything was a Falafel store for a while, you are competing with the person next to you who may not be a good employer. And the effect of it, and, and I don't think the Chamber of Commerce wants to be the one rooting out the bad apples. Because the truth of the matter is there will always be good and there will always be bad. And if you have a law, it brings the bad employers up to a level where they have to compete with the good ones before you get into frills 
<laughs> so that was Thank you. the point I wanted to make. Okay, and I think if you can pass the mic back behind you. There's one more. Hi, I'm Nancy Rankin, and I was introduced earlier as the author of the Sick in the City Report. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on the costs and ask a question. Um, first, I think some of the estimates of how much it would cost a business um, that were presented assumes that every worker uses every sick day they're entitled to. And in fact, we know that's not the case. On average, people only use a few sick days. Um, the second concern is that in, in other cases, like when there's a small um, uptick in the minimum wage, it goes up 10 cents or a quarter, or gas prices inch up and so on. There is an across the board cost increase. What ultimately happens is that costs are passed along to the consumers or absorbed by the workers, or companies figure out a different way to um, have some cost savings. You know, a dry cleaner might use cheaper hangers or something. And I was just wondering why you thought in this case that the whole, you know, in other words, even though the, the law doesn't say that the costs are shared, that in fact, ultimately, wouldn't the costs be shared that, that by the consumers, by the public, you know, as, as it's fair, they should be because the public's going to benefit by not having sick workers serve them and so on. So in, in this case, don't you think that like a, a minimum wage and other cost increases, that ultimately the cost would be passed along to consumers and in, in yes, but, you born know, in part by the workers. That's also the point of the small business and, the, and this economy. They, they're struggling to get customers now. You're asking them to raise their rates and raise all the, the cost to the consumer. The, their customers are going to run to the next guy or to the next town or go shop out up in Westchester. But if everybody the has field. the same but cost. But we're not leveling the playing field because you're doing something in New York City that you're not doing in New Jersey when we know New Yorkers already go across the bridge to shop in New Jersey because there's less taxes. Or they're going to Westchester to work. Or they're going taking their business out to Long Island. You are not leveling the playing field by putting this bill in New York City and not everywhere across the country. Andrew? <laughs> not a slice of pizza, but you know, if my pizza goes up, then I'm not going to go buy pizza. I'll go uh, cook at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I certainly won't walk across the street because we know New Yorkers, we always stay on our one side of the street. I think, let, let's, <laughs> Andrew. Cap, right? I have a question for um, Shabani and then for Mary. One, on, for Shabani, the, the restaurant workers, particularly wait staff, are paid through tips primarily. Mm -hmm. How does this address that issue? I mean, it can't really, can it? Or First, I want to speak to the, quickly to the point you made about mothers. Um, I have to say, with female restaurant workers I've met, and even my own mother, who's not a restaurant worker, all her sick time was to take care of oh, me and my brother oh, or her mother, my grandmother. So I think that is really important in terms of family balance. Um, in terms of restaurant workers, the way the bill is written currently is, so currently the tip minimum wage in New York um, State is 4.75 plus tips is what you make. As you can imagine, um, that's why a lot of the restaurant workers in the city are at or below the poverty level. Keep in mind that most tipped workers in the country are women. And with that being said, that's why the bill as it is written, um, a sick day, a em restaurant employee who would take a sick day would get paid at no less than the state minimum wage, which is still not a living wage, but it is above the tip minimum wage at 725. And, and, and there's no, there's absolutely nothing in any of these bills that would force a restaurant owner to try to make up the tips in some way. It's, it's the minimum wage. And in Washington, D.C., tip wor workers are, are exempt. Washington's D.C. bill is much more acceptable than the San Francisco bill to the business community because it's got carve-outs for those specific issues. So and I wasn't able to answer that, that one comment that, that you were asking about the cost. And you're absolutely right. None of us know if a worker's going to take all their sick days or a few days. None of us know the real answers. But the question is, and, and we're not even addressing the fact that if a, a worker is out we're not even talking about the replacement cost that the business owner now has to go and hire somebody from time and a half to cover the shift or the, that particular day for that worker. So none of these costs are including 
the potential yeah, replacement yeah. cost. Yeah. But with all due respect, you're um, assuming that all employers, especially in the restaurant industry, are paying fair overtime. This is part to redress a systematic disparity to restaurant workers. Okay, but, but the point is if, if I have a restaurant worker and they're making 475 and they're out, and they and now I have to hire bring in somebody else even at 475. I'm paying twice. Nancy, I, I believe okay. I believe the analyses that we're talking about do take into account of replacement workers. There's also I mean, and it is in a sense an average because there's some industries where you don't have replacement workers. But that is like, that's the the studies we're talking about do take that into account. Well, that's, not okay. That's that's, that's that uh, the uh, labor department that just came out with those numbers. I'm not sure that they do. And even the restaurant, even the business owners that gave me the statistics, they they didn't include like that twelve thousand or the thirty. They didn't include include the replacement cost because you really don't know what it is. But I'm just saying that that's one cost that hasn't been addressed and is very hard to, uh, to recognize, but it is an extra cost. Okay. Nancy, yeah. did you have a comment about that? And then we have one question yeah. here. The, uh, Andrew, after that, this man with the black jacket has been waiting. Yes, we also have the Institute for Women's Policy Research. <clears throat> they did an independent estimate of the cost for New York City using New York City level wages and so on. And they took into account assumptions about a certain percentage would have um, have to pay for replacement, replacement costs. Uh -huh. So it is factored in. And they came up with 21 cents per hour worked as the average, which is close to the BLS. It's actually a little lower. Um, the other thing is that often when a worker is out, just other workers cover it. Mm -hmm. and and they don't have replacement right. costs. And on, on the contrary, now if a worker is home getting unpaid sick time, you know, they still may have to pay that um, replacement cost if they have to hire a temp to fill in, so it's not a new right. cost okay. from the bill. And then if you could pass it to this man over here, please. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Tim Judson. I'm the workers' rights policy specialist with the Progressive States Network, um, which is working on this issue on a state, li sta on a state level nationally. Um, and I also used to work for the uh, Hotel Trades Council, the Hotel Workers Union in New York City, uh, where we were very involved in the state minimum wage board um, examination of the minimum wage orders for tipped workers last year. And so I was, I'm particularly curious about the discussions around um, you know, the enforcement issues, uh, particularly regarding any amendments that are going to be made moving forward. Uh, there's been a lot of discussions so far uh, about you know, the multiple ramifications of how, the, you know, how, this, how this law would be enforced and you know, the, the nuances of how it's going to be interpreted you know, for various employers in various situations. Uh, one of the things that I can, you know, that I'm, that I think we can all agree to is that, um, you know, New York um, has a very, very complex um, legal structure around a lot of its statutes. Um, the minimum wage, um, you know, is no, is no exception to that, um, especially for tipped workers. And one of the things we found when we an analyzed the existing laws last year is that the New York minimum wage law, as it applies to tipped workers, and you know, this is, I think, relevant because of the paid sick days issue, is so complex. There are so many different provisions that it's almost impossible for employers and employees, you know, you know, uh, to know uh, where they stand in relation to the law and how it should be enforced, and even to may be able to make complaints to the enforcement agencies mm -hmm. when there are violations. And so, um, to the extent that you know, there are you know, going to be negotiations about um, you know, sort of uh, further carve-outs or um, or other provisions of this law, I'm wondering if you know part of the discussion around around the enforcement issue is going to be how complex the law will be to enforce if there are further exceptions made beyond um, you know, the, the small employer versus large employer question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, question. Quick, just quick, quick <laughs> 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 Yeah, Nancy, you want to respond Nancy to mentioned that, first? that the, the cost of replacing an employee cost in sick or, or with the replacement and overtime, also service over, usually suffers. If I happen to work in the post office, you know, I'm here because they call on sick, by the way. Now, if you ever wonder why <laughs> your mailman comes in at 3 p.m. in the afternoon to deliver your mail or why you got to spend another 20 minutes online 
is because employees are out sick. That's okay. why. I think in, insinuating the big mistake here is we all know New Yorkers are hardworking folks. Like insinuating that workers are going to abuse the system. Even Speaker Quinn, who has not taken a position, that is not a dialogue that any of us should engage in. We're all hardworking New Yorkers, and I think that's very important. I'm sure you will. I, I, sure I, I, I just want to point out we started out the conversation with agreeing that there are good employers and there are bad employers. There are good employees and there are bad employees. And New York City is not an exception. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure it's just about being good or being bad, though, because one of the things we haven't really focused on is that the individuals who are less likely to be covered by paid sick leave are also women and and members of underrepresented groups. So women and people of color, and women in low uh, and people in a low wage um, earning positions. And so, one of the challenges we have is that the the outcome of the lack of this legislation disproportionately impacts certain groups Absolutely. of individuals who we as New York. New and New York legislators have tried to um, provide a level playing field for them as well. So the idea is that you know individuals from across the spectrum should have the same kind of protections. And I think that that's something that we miss when we don't think about who is actually affected by the lack of legislation. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, the woman in with the glasses back there, and I think then we're going to have to wrap it up. Right, raise your hand, please, so we can bring you a mic. I can shout. Okay. Video. <laughs> Um, just kind of in response. And could you identify yourself? Oh, please? I'm Cassie Jones, and I am a student here at the new school. Great. Um, so in response to leveling out the playing field and um, giving a voice to you know each individual, I'm more curious about undocumented workers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm in a class right now that works with Rock New York, um, so I'm kind of familiar with the lack of agency that a lot of undocumented workers have. And in response to um, Nancy's point about speaking and, and viewing the larger spectrum of what's going on and attacking all the different issues and paying attention to all the different issues, well, what happens when an undocumented worker is being violated, um, being spoken to improperly, is sick? Um, how or what will encourage that undocumented worker to access the health department when there is fear about being deported or other issues? I mean, what is it right. going to encourage? Will the health department set up some type of clinic that um, will help those workers? I mean, I, yes, I feel like you're really kind of glossing over and idealizing. No, I'm, I'm not because what's going, to, what's going to make that worker if there's a law or there's not a law, go to whoever it is to enforce this. I'm if sorry, there's not a law, just... so if the undocumented worker doesn't want to speak up because they're undocumented, even if there's a law, they're still not going to want to speak up. Okay. Well, that's a we're talking about a theoretical yeah, now. We actually have a very uh, you know a likely reality coming. So I think um, and. We have to we have to wrap it up. So I, I thank you all a lot for uh, coming and talking and being so knowledgeable about this. And um, I, you know, look forward with all of you to seeing what's going to happen. I want to thank Sharon and thank the panel. And um, I encourage you to take a look at the book over here. And uh, see you next time.